and welcome to Man Enough. I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Jamie Heath. And uh, oh, we have Shane and Hannah Burkaw. Shane is an old friend of mine. I've known Shane for probably eight or not nine years now. He was in the first season of My Last Days which is a show I made about people with uh, uh, terminal or chronic illnesses. Mm. And Shane has a rare disease called spinal muscular atrophy, SMA. And um, he basically, he's, uh, he's in a wheelchair. Um, he, he doesn't have full use of his arms or his legs. Uh, he needs a, a caretaker. And um, Hannah is not just his wife, but his caretaker. And mm. they... Uh, they defy a lot of the traditional conceptions about what marriage should look like and and mm -hmm. Shane and, and Shane especially like what it means to be a man and I am so excited to have them on the show because I have so many questions me so too many. I'm, I've, I've been following them on on social forever and I'm really I didn't even know that they'd been booked so when I went it's, it's like we were all connected um with our minds because i i've been really really obsessed with them like um, a little i've been in a little bit of a parasocial relationship with them I won't oh lie. okay i kind of feel like wow. I'm, I'm just their friend um already so we'll see if uh well <laughs> let's get to it let's get i to can't it. wait can't wait can't wait to hear it and learn some stuff we'll be right back this is man enough this episode is brought to you by procter and gamble with over 1.3 billion people with disabilities across the globe, currently only 4% of businesses are actively developing products and solutions with this largest minority group in mind. Through their brands, P&G is committed to serving the people with disabilities community with inclusive and accessible products. Herbal Essences was the first mass hair care brand in North America to introduce tactile markings to help differentiate shampoo and conditioner for those with vision impairment. Olay introduced an easy open lid in 2021, a prototype developed with and for people with disabilities with an easy open winged cap, extra grip, raised lid, high contrast product label, and braille text to make beauty products more accessible. And Pantene has committed to bringing NaviLens to point of sale and product, a unique technology for visibility impaired people who have difficulty using traditional signage and therefore cannot be autonomous in unfamiliar environments. PNG recognizes that this is a long journey and will continue to work to create an accessible and inclusive world that benefits all. Hello and welcome to the Man Enough podcast. We have uh, we have a very special couple on the show today. A dear friend of mine and his bride, <laughs> Shane and Hannah Burkaw. Hi guys. What's up? Hey. Thank you for having us. And I have not met Hannah in person. Yeah, which is weird because you've seen me naked. <laughs> oh. Um, <laughs> oh listen, okay. Hannah gets to bathe this man who I love dearly. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah, it's so awesome to officially meet you. It is so great to meet you too. I've heard a lot. <laughs> you guys go way back. Yeah. So I'm excited to finally meet you. Can we clear something right before we get into this? Yeah. Hannah, you reached out to Shane after you watched a documentary. <laughs> was it? What documentary was it? Because I know wasn't. someone who made a documentary about Shane who's right here in this in this mm -hmm. chat. <laughs> yes, it was that documentary. It was the Soul Pancake video. What? Yeah. Oh so it's my God. Too. Justin, you are wow. literally like... A significant reason that we are married and happily together for almost uh, six years. Yeah. What? Yes. <laughs> oh gosh, don't tell him that. Please do not tell him oh! that. <laughs> he, he he likes to claim he's re the reason for my own marriage and my my wife because he introduced us. And yeah. so, you know, every time we have a child, he's like, Wait. You're welcome. You're welcome. <laughs> so don't, don't. Um, yeah, first no, of all. First of all, Jamie, you say I like to claim. You just explained that that I introduced you. Second of all, Shane and Hannah, I did not know that. Yeah, some something about that video. She saw through all of you know my <laughs> terrible jokes and my potty humor, and she reached out and was like, "Hey, let's wow!" Be so, so, 
for anybody who doesn't know, I, I spent I spent years making a documentary series called My Last Days about people living with chronic or terminal illnesses. And Shane was a part of the first season of the show. Uh, we partnered with Soul Pancake. I, we made that show for nothing. And for the audience, Jamie was the composer of that entire mm. season. But there's so much more to talk about. Liz, can you tell the audience about Shane and Hannah? Yes. Where do we begin? Wow. What a beautiful intro. Also, Justin, um, I'm waiting for my matchmake, uh, since you've matchmaked everyone on this podcast um, <laughs> episode. I've been thinking about it a lot, actually, Liz. You are, I'm going to be very, very, very picky with you. You are, uh, <laughs> you're, a, you're a diamond. That's right. So sweet. All right. Uh, Shane and Hannah Burkhoff are relationship bloggers on a mission to change the way that society understands disability. On their YouTube channel, Squirming Grubs, which has garnered almost a million subscribers uh, and worldwide attention in its first two years, the couple shares a hilarious and authentic examination of what it's like to be in an interabled relationship. Showcasing together, they're really no different than any other couple. Um, I think they're be better than most couples I've met. Uh, I I'm going <laughs> to need a lot of advice uh, because I, I know you have so much of it to share. Um, Hannah films and edits uh, the Squirmy and Grubs blog. She's spoken at many prestigious uh, universities, Fortune 500 companies, um, about the realities of ableism on her very popular Instagram account, of which I am one of a gazillion followers. She advocates for acceptance of all people, works to improve the way that society thinks about disability. Uh, and Shane is the author of several award-winning books about disability. He's the president of a nonprofit organization called Laughing at My Nightmare and a renowned speaker who has performed across the country at places like Harvard University um, and the University of Florida hmm. and the University of Connecticut, Princeton, and many, many more. Thank you so much for joining us. We're so happy to have you. We're so happy to be here. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, very excited. Thank you. So uh, one of the first things we always ask our guests is this question, and this goes for, and this goes to both of you. Uh, when was the last time that each of you didn't feel enough? I think the last time I didn't feel enough, I don't know if it's like a specific moment, but sometimes when I'm on social media, like Instagram, I will feel like I'm not enough because I'm seeing mm. other people doing things that I want to be doing or, you know, wearing something that I wish I had. Uh, so I don't know if it's like a specific moment, but I will find myself feeling like not enough when I'm comparing myself to somebody else online. Mm. And the last time that I think I felt not enough um, was a few days ago. We discovered very late at night that we had no clean underwear for the next day. We had to do laundry. Um, and I physically cannot do laundry. So Hannah had to trudge to the washing machine and it's outside That's it's outside of the yeah. Airbnb. Mm. trudge to the washing machine is kind of a weird thing yeah uh <laughs> and do the laundry late at night when she was tired and i felt like i should be the one doing that in that moment mm. you're listening to the mad enough podcast we'll be right back now a word from our sponsor better help hey everyone it's jamie heath from the man enough podcast and you know, like I do, that life can be overwhelming. And many people are burned out without even knowing it. Symptoms can include lack of motivation, feeling helpless or trapped, detachment, fatigue, and more. And for myself, I get really impatient when I'm burned out. I'm a person that has to juggle a lot of things at once. And it's just what comes with having a business and having a family. And, and I want to be present with my family. But some days I'm just so exhausted. It's hard to even figure out what I want to eat, let alone how I'm feeling. It's a disorienting experience, but I know it's important to make time for me as well. We associate burnout with work, but that's not the only cause. Any of our roles in life can lead us to feel burned out, and BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life. Thanks to my own journey in therapy, I've been able to give myself the space to decompress and assess my needs reflect on opportunities for growth, and better navigate life with helpful tools and a fresh perspective, all thanks to my therapist. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's so much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com 
slash man enough. That's better. H E L P dot com slash man enough. All right. Welcome back to the man enough podcast. You know, I was, uh, Hannah, I don't know if you know this, but I was with Shane on his first road trip when he left home without his dad, who was his primary caretaker for the first time to go to his first speech. Um, for laughing at my nightmare. What, how many years was that? What was that, like nine years ago? That had to be nine years ago. And I I can't imagine what that that looked like. <laughs> I I was, I was such a baby. And like getting up on that stage for the first time, having no idea what I was doing. And today, it's just like a normal part of my career with Hannah. But yeah, back then, I was a, I was a baby. You were amazing. And it was so clear even back then that you had so much to offer the world. But we're talking about masculinity today. And mm. I I would love to know, I want to, I want to, first of all, I just want to take this over to Hannah for a second, because I would love to know the, 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 the story. Um, cause you saw him, you reached out to him when you reached out to him that first time, was it like, Oh, wow. I feel something in my soul. This could be my husband. It was it just, oh, I just want to be around him. He seems so funny. Was it attraction? I'm really curious. And then I'd love to get into that dynamic and Shane, like masculinity and and you as a man and and what that looks like. And I want, you know, I hope we can talk about sex, which I love I know you love to talk about, Shane. <laughs> um, and and uh and all of this stuff. So there's so much we want to get into, but I'd love to Hannah, just from your perspective to hear like how that all happened and what you felt inside of you when you watched that episode. Yeah, I think it was, it was, I want to be around him. That was like the general feeling. I thought that he was really funny. I just felt like we would get along. I, I like just could tell. And I was right. <laughs> like it turned out <laughs> clearly. That. Yeah, clearly. <laughs> but I watched the video and I was like, oh my God, like this could be a, like a, a perfect friend. And I mean, I lived in Minnesota. Shane lived in Pennsylvania. I wasn't like, watching it and being like, uh, maybe I'll marry this guy. Uh, I didn't expect us to like date because we were super far away. Um, but I just wanted to be friends. And I honestly didn't even expect more than like one email. I just wanted to be like, wow, that was a great video, you know, great blog. Um, but Shane emailed back and we began texting and we FaceTimed like the next day and just like never stopped. I was super suave. I, <laughs> in, my, in my first email response, I slipped my phone number in at the end. I was like, yeah, yeah, very casual. Send me a text. And I did. <laughs> and she did. So, uh, yeah, the rest is history. Wow. Oh, wow. When, when, when you met for the first time, what was that like? That was after two months of FaceTiming daily for like four hours a day. So we knew each other. We were already in love by then. Oh, we'd said I love like you. Like we had said, I love you over FaceTime. Uh, oh. So meeting in person, oh. it was very natural because we already knew each other so well. It was also terrifying. Yeah. Well, I was a little bit afraid that like, you know, I was flying across the country alone. What if you didn't pick me up at the airport? Like, you know, there were fears. Oh, I almost didn't pick you up. You, Shane was 45 minutes late to pick me up at the airport. And he's a time planner. So it, it turns out that it really was traffic. But the first day I was like, are you irresponsible? I remember. So my brother had to help me drive down to Philly to pick her up at the airport um, because I can't drive. Uh and, and for anyone listening, I use a wheelchair, um, just in case you're not visualizing me. Um, and so Andrew, my brother, is in the car right there. Hannah gets in, and the Philly airport is wild. So we barely stop the car. We just, like, open the door. We're like, jump in. So Hannah gets in, and there has been all this, like, build up to this moment. And then we couldn't really reach each other yeah, because she was in the car i was in the back we wanted to like impart you know like it's been all these all this time yeah but we couldn't so we had to wait for the drive home mm -hmm. until we could finally hug and all that yep mm. <laughs> why were you terrified shane uh because she's like the most perfect human being um that i have ever met and um you know like like we said there was this like emotional and physical like tension. And so, you know, I, I had those like butterflies that you get when you're, you know, in middle school and you have a crush. Um, I had them in such a 
profound way. My hands were sweating. Uh, <laughs> and it didn't really go away that whole like first weekend that we were together. It was just yeah. constant bliss. Yeah. It was mm. fun. When I was a kid, I had an uncle. His name is Danny, and he had polio. And his wife, uh, Joyce, was like our auntie, and their kids were my cousins, Sonny and Piper. Uh, I was like five, six, seven. And of course, at that age, I, you, you don't even see any differences or see any challenges. And, you, know, you just see a couple. But then you get older and you start to process and you recognize some of the challenges that are there. And then you hear the whisperings of other people, um, judgments or confusion. What is wrong with her? Why would she want to be with him? Why would she want to take on um, whatever that may look like? And I started hearing this processing and didn't didn't know what to do with it. And then it started infiltrating my own mind. And then, you know, start, I found, found myself having judgments to, towards her. And then it was also um, traditionally what I thought a woman might want in a man. And is this person, my uncle, who I loved, able to provide that for a woman? And all of that would go through my head. And then they, of course, were t together forever and ever. He has since passed. He was much older. Um, but I'm, I'm curious if you're comfortable um, maybe speaking to that a bit. What is that like for you, Hannah, in terms of um, why that is not a concern for you or, or is it and how that feels? And then also for you, Shane, um, knowing traditionally what the world says a man is supposed to be and how to show up and how that might um you know, affect you or, or not. Yeah. yeah. I think when we first started dating, I didn't really think about that at all. And no one that I knew said anything that was like, why were you with Shane? Um, which was lucky. Like my family just didn't like judge our relationship and, you know, they met Shane and thought he was great. <laughs> um, and I didn't really get any like of those judgments until we started our YouTube channel, which was two years into our relationship. And then we started getting tons of comments and it's probably still our biggest oh, yeah. comment today is what's wrong with her. And like, why would she do this? Mm. Um, so I think it was helpful that we had two years of a relationship before we started getting those judgments, because by then it was like, well, whatever. Like, I know this is a great relationship. And if that had hit us earlier on, I might've been more like, oh, you know, am I making the wrong choice? Um, but really I just try to ignore those people. And we know that, that those ideas come from this idea that, you know, disabled people are less than abled people and a disabled man, you know, can't provide the right things for a woman. And like, personally, I just don't have those beliefs. Like, I don't think that my husband needs to be like, you know, a, a protector or whatever, like be able to chase a bear away, like whatever people <laughs> literally comment things and be like, you know, he needs to be able to mow the lawn. I'm like, well, like, why? Wait, like, no, really? <laughs> because why can't he just be the one that's like doing our taxes? Like, he's just doing <laughs> right. Um, so we just have a different balance in our relationship, and that feels right for us. Yeah, I, I was. I mean, the, the idea of how that affects me, society's attitudes about masculinity, is a huge, like, lifelong topic for me. So without giving you my entire life history, in like high school, as people began dating more seriously, and I kind of had that in my world now, um, I quickly gathered that, you know, I might not be a valuable partner. Um, and that was because in high school, being boyfriend and girlfriend, meant having your boyfriend pick you up and drive you to school or skipping mm. school for the day and going to the beach, um, you know, going to parties, things that were difficult to do or impossible to do in my wheelchair. Um, and so suddenly I felt like I internalized kind of those, those ableist ideas from our society that I had to be the one, you know, picking her up and uh, mm. able to like give a hug and things like that. Um, and I, I had no like self confidence, no, um, uh, you know, belief that I would ever be a good partner. As I got older and went to college and met more people with a, a wider view of the world, um, 
I realized that, you know, those attitudes and traditional beliefs didn't apply to everyone. They didn't need to apply. Um, mm -hmm. We just kind of pretended they do. Um, and that's when I began to like open myself up to the possibility of having a partner. Um, you know, I think I said in the video that, um, you know, Justin and uh, Jamie and Soul Pancake made um, that, you know, I, I wanted someone to share my life with, but that I kind of doubted that that was possible. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's tough. Like, there are days when I get really annoyed that I can't help do the dishes. Um, but, like, most days, um, I know that I am contributing just as much to our life and our relationship as Hannah is. And I can do that, you know, whether or not I can bench a hundred pounds. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I think there's something so in interesting about, about all of that. Right. So when I, so I, I wrote a book about masculinity, interviewed a lot of different men about the concept of masculinity and the most interesting, um, displays of masculinity and the most interesting definitions I've got um, were from the men who didn't fit neatly into uh, the sort of prototypical stereotypes or, or expectations that we have of men in yeah. our society. And men with, with disabilities and, and you know, uh, physical disabilities particularly talk to me about ev everything that you're saying, right? That there's uh, this idea that you have to be a protector, you have to be a provider, and how are you going to do either of those things um, in a society uh, that is ableist, right? Where you are limited physically because of environments aren't accessible or that we have an ableist workplace uh, where, I mean, you have an amazing job. You created <laughs> this amazing career for yourself, but I'm sure it uh, wasn't always uh, clear that that would happen. And there are many people who probably told you not even to think that you would be able to self-sustain yourself. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm curious, knowing those things, right? That bench pressing, first of all, also, I've never been uh, sort of better off as a woman because I was a man who could bench press a certain amount or like <laughs> do a certain physical task, right? There's so many things that go into being a great partner uh, to a woman that have nothing to do with those things. And maybe if we were uh, more open and more flexible in our definitions of masculinities, uh, maybe more men would be able to take on roles that, that would, I think, make them happier and make, make, make their partners happier. But all that being said, you know, given your life and, and, and all of the ways that you have felt um, pressured to be a certain way. Like, what does being a man mean to you? Mm. Oof, that's a great question. Um, being a man. It's funny, like, in my everyday life, I don't think of myself as a man, or I don't think of myself as a, gen a gender. You know what I mean? Mm. I, I, I am a man, and I uh, identify that way, but it's not something that factors into my everyday life. Like, I'm never like, I should do this because I'm a man. Um, I'm sure, you know, uh, uh, somewhere uh, inside of me, I'm acting on those uh, mm -hmm. identifiers. But um, to me, I think it's about being honest, um, working hard. Like, I, I am driven by success and achievement and productivity even like i think that my those are those are I also masculine that, qualities mm -hmm. are they mm -hmm. <laughs> oh i will see there you go yeah. so <laughs> so the world says so the world says so the world says yeah but um i think i probably compensate for not mm. being able to mm. take the trash out or mow the lawn you know, things that I feel like I should be helping out with by being as productive as I can, being as successful as I can, so that I can support us and our, you know, eventual family. Um, yeah, I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. And you do a lot of emotional labor. I mean, I've seen the, one of the things I've, I've been so impressed in, in your interviews is, you know, you really are specific about what you need and you say it. Right. I mean, if we we want to get into sex, um, you know, Go you there, talk Liz. in, in Go one there. of your videos, we're getting there. We're going in. Uh, <laughs> you know, you say I can't initiate sex physically. And so I will literally say 
do you want to have sex? <laughs> and I just think, wow, if most couples were able to have uh, conversations yeah. like that about sex that were as direct and, and clear about what you need, like maybe so many of us wouldn't need as much couples therapy as we need, you, you know, or, or, or end up going to. So I, I think that your relationship actually I mean, is is not inspiring in a, you know, disability like inspiration porn kind of way, but really um, a blueprint for how relationships should be. Thank you. Uh -huh. <laughs> and, and so just being there for your partner to listen to them and talk through things with them and kind of just like figure out life together. Like Hannah and mm -hmm. I made almost all of our decisions together um, from like what we're having for dinner to like what our goals are for five years from now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that kind of like communication and listening to each other is another part of what I consider like being a good man. Yeah, um, and the communication, I think the communication in our relationship is made stronger by your disability. Yeah. You know, because like what you were saying, when Shane, you know, can't initiate and, you know, something physically, we talk about it. Yeah. And even just like talking about like, I don't want to get like too detailed, but you know, if he's no, says, you like, can go there, get go into there. it. <laughs> Come we on. want every bit. Come on. <laughs> but even just like Shane saying, you know, can you move my arm to the right? Like little things right. like that that keep us way more connected than we otherwise would be, I think, make mm. our relationship stronger, you know, just like talking yeah. about lots of things that we wouldn't otherwise. Yeah. Like in the beginning of our relationship, when I was helping Hannah to learn how to like take care of me, like lift me out of my wheelchair put me in a comfortable position in the bed, but then also like relationship intimacy stuff, like how we can cuddle together, how she can undress me. Um, I, I had to do all of that with my voice. I had to explain like, this is how it will be comfortable. This is how it will be safe. Mm -hmm. um, and that resulted in so much like laughter and just like, bond in because mm -hmm. yeah it was like these intimate moments where i'm like now to take my boxers off yeah. lift up my hips like <laughs> you know and we, we had fun with it yeah i love that that's that's mm. uh, my marriage um three months in or not even three months two months into our marriage i had an injury um that justin and i ex experienced together um where he essentially ripped my ankle off of my body oh, oh my god nice. oh my god jamie <laughs> Let's Jamie. just go with that what? narrative because that's not. Really... No, no. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll talk. We'll talk about we'll, this another another right, time. Go ahead. No, no, no. Well, you set it up now, so now you got to get a follow through because that's we not what zip... happened. Yeah, no, no. I, that's a joke. But we were <laughs> in a zip lining accident, and he's Hercules, and I'm not. And when we crashed into each other, it's a too long of a story to share, but when we crashed into each other, Jamie was... forgot to put his legs down and get to the other side of the zip line. And he started going backwards and the, the guys, did, it was so, it was so far away. The guys couldn't see and they sent me. So here we are, I'm going 40 miles an hour, like 500 feet over the Costa Rican forest. And here's this dummy flying towards I'm me because he, he was showing off for his new wife on video and he forgot to put his feet down and we collided in midair yes. both of us going probably 30 to 40 miles an hour and oh it was a terrible oh terrible crash God. but essentially what, what what to the point i'm making is that the accident was so bad that i didn't think i'd ever walk again um there was a conversation about amputating my foot um and even if they could do surgery would i ever it walk was terrible again? um oh. so so there was that. But when I came home, now my wife and I had just been married maybe two months. So mm -hmm. the first six weeks really of our marriage, I was stuck on a couch and couldn't move. Um, so she had to literally bathe me and wipe me and feed me. And even though this was a temporary um, period of time, it was in that time that our relationship grew the most. It, uh, it, everything was incredible because of kind of what you spoke to, Hannah. Like she had to ask me, you know, uh, I had to ask her, can you move my arm here? Can you do this? Can you do this? And I was forced to ask for assistance in a way that I never was comfortable with before. Mm -hmm. And in that period, so now had, let's say that six weeks was extended to six years or the rest of my life. Our relationship was still our relationship. It was still beautiful. It was still wonderful. All of these traditional things that I thought meant having a, a successful relationship uh, was, was reframed during that time. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, my brother uh, hey i will thank you till the day i die for, for for my wife is everything and and hannah can can you speak to you know every relationship has its struggles we know that 
my daughter got married recently and um, I had to talk to her like, hey, here's some things that come with that. How do you feel about that? Um, you might have a white person marrying into a black family. Those are real issues that, um, not issues, those are real things that might come up that one might have to have the strength or you know, uh, ability to navigate through. We all have to weigh those things out. Or I have some friends, women that like the man doesn't make enough money. And what does that mean? That's a, that's a real thing. Like how, where am I going to live? How will we live? Um, whatever those things are. So I imagine that, uh, though there are real things that we always have to consider. On the other hand, it's always interesting to hear aside from that stuff. What is it that this person does for my life? And Hannah, could you tell us, um, what is it that Shane does for you? What is it that just has stole your heart? Why mm. is he the man in your, that you love so desperately? Yeah. I mean, I think the biggest, you know, struggle that we have in our relationship, like you were talking about is other people's perception of our relationship. Like by far, that is what bothers me the most. Mm. Um, so Oftentimes I I will literally think about, you know, I know what our relationship is like. These people who are commenting things online don't know. And I'll remind myself of all the things that Shane does for me. You know, like I know that he is the most emotionally supportive person I've ever met. Like he is the best communicator and the best, like, you know, open with his emotions person. Like he's definitely helped me become more open with my emotions um, and talk about those things more. Um, he's just really skilled at that. And so in our relationship, I've, I think, grown a lot. Right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, when, mm. when Hannah and I met, not to get like too far down the rabbit hole here, but um, <laughs> she didn't feel comfortable having like long conversations about emotion feelings. or feelings yeah. and things like that. And that's always been big for me. Um, I think that's why Justin and I fell so hardly in love. Um, but, uh, madly in love, Shane. madly in love, uh, madly, <laughs> truly. Um, so, I, you know, on these long FaceTimes together where both of us really wanted to be there, you know, we, I, I made her talk. Yeah, all, we, you know, so, <laughs> all we could do was talk. We were long distance for two years. So like, that was, I mean, aside from a visit, every month or so, like that was all we had to do. Yeah. So there was a lot of talking. But I think just mm. looking at like Hannah then when we first met, and I am taking zero credit for this. Other than the fact, <laughs> I'm giving you credit. But, but other than the fact that I like made her talk to me. Um, <laughs> I, listening at her then and not now, speaking like at auditoriums full of thousands of people and like mm. making YouTube videos that get watched by millions of people, I'm just like so... It's neat to see like how comfortable she is now, you know, talking about her emotions. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And aside from that, Shane also just is such a hard worker. So, you know, aside from like the emotional aspect of our of our relationship, you know, like what he brings to it is also so much, you know, hard work in terms of like our career because we do also work together. Um, so, you know, working together has been nothing but a good thing because he's such a hard worker and because we get along so perfectly. It's because of my calendar. Your calendar is very precise, but we also just never get sick of each other. We, you know, our sense of humor is mm. the same. I think it's just spending time together is, you know, it's better than being alone, which like for mm. me is rare. Hannah told me, I don't know, maybe a year, a year into our relationship that even with her very, very best friends, even with her her mom, who is her best friend, um, it, after being with them for a certain amount of time, Hannah needs to be alone and decompress. Um, you know, as an introvert, she just needs that time to recharge and not have to worry about talking to someone or uh, being with another person. But mm -hmm. she told me that as we are spending days and weeks together with like no separation like when we went on a road trip together and spent literally a month in the same room yeah. or car at every moment of the day she was like i am not feeling like i need to go decompress when i'm with you and that's mm. like that was brand mm. new for her yeah and the sign for me that like wow that like this is real you and know? now it's been four years of living together <laughs> non-stop and we <laughs> still wow. have a break mm. every once in a while she'll be like I'm going to go into the bedroom <laughs> and close the door, <laughs> but it's very rare. Yeah, just yeah. my last thought was how 
how much joy it brings me, number one, that you guys have each other. And, you know, whenever you see two people in love and, and navigating life together, how beautiful that is, no matter who those two people may be. And also, I love how much you both get to debunk um, concepts of what relationships really are told to us that they're supposed to be. You know, you, Shane, are, are, are demonstrating to men and this should not be your responsibility in life. Your responsibility yeah. should just be to experience joy and love. But we do know that, you know, with our life, we have opportunities to share and, and, and enlighten humanity. And you get to demonstrate to men that what we think we need to be is not accurate. Um, we can show up in so many different ways. And that, in fact, mm -hmm. is being a man. And Hannah, also what you get to demonstrate, I think, for so many is what women or even men of sex, same sex relationships or whatever, but what you think you need and what someone is supposed to give you is in fact not really it most of the time. It's so much more. It's really about spiritual and emotional connection. The debunking thing is really interesting because when you look at, you know, contemporary society, social media, TikTok, Bumble, you know, Tinder, all of these things, we tend to always, and I'm going to generalize here, uh, but what we tend to work from the outside in, it's, I dream of someone who's six feet, two. I need someone who's six feet two, or, oh, I'm so drawn to big hands or a big dick or whatever the wow. thing is, right? Like, I'm, no, I'm just saying, like, this is what, this is what we see. This is what, yes. this is what we see every day that men feel like they have to measure up to this socialization around masculinity and how both, I will say, men and women genders are deeply affected by this idea, right? And, you know, we talk about internal misogyny that a lot of women experience. Um, obviously, men feel like we have to measure up in all the ways. Shane, I know you've been dealing with this your whole life. So in some ways, you've had to build your superhero armor around it and have it not affect you. But, but what are the struggles around that? You know, are, are, you know, cause there's, be there's beautiful men everywhere, Hannah, right? You, you know, you look at the Jason Momoa's of the world and I wonder, is there a part of your brain that's like, huh, I wonder what that'd be like, or, oh, Shane gives me everything. And Shane, like, you know, do you ever feel like, I don't know, angry or insecure, or I just, I want to, let's, let's take it a level deeper. And I'd love to talk more about that because here I am oftentimes making other men feel insecure, right? by my presence or having women drawn to me, yet I feel like I don't measure up a lot. And that's what I wrote my whole book about. It's like, if I'm feeling this way, then everybody must have if, and must experience this in some way. So what is it like for you guys? Anna wrote something yesterday on a post that she made um, that was answering the question, what attracted her to me? People often very rudely say things like, you know, how on earth are you attracted to him? Oh, her, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, oh, lovely. It makes me feel wonderful. Um, her point that she made was that my physical appearance and ability and, my physical and her physical appearance and ability have nothing to do with our relationship getting stronger and stronger for six years. Like, that's just not part of it. Mm. Um so that I just I wanted to share that because I thought mm. it was very true. Yeah. Um talking about like moments in our relationship when we might feel insecure. Um it, in daily life, you have days uh or experiences where everything goes wrong. Um <laughs> we, we all we all have had this day where, you know, we we are driving somewhere and our tire blows out and then we're late for our dinner reservation and then the food that we order is bad. On days like those, I really, really, really wish that I could get out of the car and fix the tire mm. or, um, you know, do more physical things to help him. Give her a back massage because I know she's stressed at the end of this day. And I've had to come to terms with the fact that like my, the things that I do contribute, which are often not helpful in those very annoying moments, you know, like 
when the tire blows, me saying, all right, well, I'll schedule the repair for tomorrow is not helpful, um, or it doesn't make Hannah feel better. Um, and how do you get out of that, Shane? How, how do you, and because I'm, I'm asking personally, because again, I have the same things, right? Uh-huh. They're just different. And I, and if every man or woman listening to this were honest with themselves, they would have the same things. Yeah. So, I, so I'm curious when you're in that place, when the tire breaks down, when the, when the car, when the tire blows, the car breaks down, you're on the side of the road, you can't physically help in the way that you wish you could. Mm-hmm. And for that moment, you're like, wow, my, the ways that I support and my wife are not useful right now. Well, how do you get out of it? What's, what's your step-by-step process? <laughs> I, I should analyze myself more next time this happens. Um, <laughs> I think I've handled it badly in the past. Um, like, <laughs> I, I, I remember bad days where, or bad moments, I should say where I'm feeling really bad about this. And in that bad moment, I bring that up to Hannah. And, you know, I, I tell her about how frustrated I am that um, I can't do something. And I, I think that that is not conducive to those moments, which is fine. Um, mm. But those moments aren't about me, for me, if that makes sense. Like I am trying to make Hannah feel better um, and so throwing in that I feel horrible as well just doesn't improve. that makes her then makes her kind of feel like she has to take care of you on top of her exactly. feeling bad. Yeah, exactly. And and when I do it special things, she's never like angry about that, but mm. um, it doesn't help the situation for either of us. So I think today the way I handle it is to let the moment happen and play out and acknowledge that like. Yeah, there are going to be these random difficult moments in everyday life, and um, that's okay. And I don't need to fix it immediately. Like, mm. <laughs> do you remember, like, when, you, you want to talk about that? What, what just in general, like, just my fixing? Fix yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we had this conversation. Yeah, <laughs> we did. And, you know, not even just in the context of like Shane being upset about something, uh-huh. but, you know, when I would have an issue. Uh, you know, even when I was in college and I'd be on FaceTime with Shane and I'd be like, you know, I, I did badly on this paper. Shane's instinct would be to fix it. So he would be like, well, for the next paper, I can proofread it. You know, he so would Shane like, is trapped in some masculinity as okay. well. Okay, you're not perfect. <laughs> <laughs> He's trying to fix this. And, you know, and it would annoy me like a couple of times it, it would annoy me. And then eventually I was just like, can you just listen and like stop throwing out suggestions like I don't want to hear your suggestions right now I just want to tell you that I'm annoyed about something Mm -hmm. and he was like what (laughs) like this mind-blowing moment and then you know since then he has realized that like when I'm venting about something most of the time I really I don't need like suggestions for fixes yeah and it's also her venting about something that went wrong isn't doesn't mean I'm mad at you. Doesn't mean, yeah, it doesn't mean she's mad at me. Yeah. For a while, I I took every annoyance that Hannah faced mm. and I internalized it. This is my fault somehow because I can't do the things that would have prevented it or that would have resolved it immediately. Yeah. Um, but it's not. Like, like, I get annoyed about things that have nothing to do with Hannah. Yeah. And so I, was, I, I wasn't giving her, like, that read it or I don't even know what the right word is I wasn't allowing her to like feel emotions separate from me mm-hmm. I, I made it all about like yeah. oh I, that must be my fault so yeah. and this, this is all to say we've had this conversation before like this is that one and I've recognized this so now I try to just listen allow for that negative emotion um, and then cheer her up in a bit right? Yeah. and not with solutions never solutions <laughs> Yeah. Well, I was just going to say, I had one thought I just, I just wrote down as as you guys were talking that I had never thought about before. And this is why I love this podcast and love talking to, to friends like you is, you know, I think we spend most of our lives thinking that we need a certain thing. Like, why do we need to be physically strong? Like, why as men do we need to be physically strong? Why do we need to have broad shoulders or uh, 
you know, whatever it is, to be able to run or chase something or, you know, why do we need those things? And it feels like we spend the majority of our lives thinking we need something when in reality, we only need those things five or 10% of the time. That's kind of my thought talking to you guys is, yeah, Shane, you might, it might be great to be able to fix a tire, but how often does the tire blow? Yeah. Right. It might be great. It might be great to be able to, to, to scoop up your wife and carry her into the bedroom or to take, you know, but how often do you really need to do that? Because 98% of the time, 99% of the time, we don't need any of those attributes. 99% of the time, what I believe we need is what you're talking about, which is emotional intimacy, which is communication, which is listening to each other and sharing feelings. That's 99% of the time. I'm not going to not say that it's, that we don't need those things, that it's not nice to have those things, that it, that it isn't great to be able to fix a tire. But if you really strap, bring it down to the brass tacks of it all, it's not our whole lives. It's a, it's a, it's a tiny part of it. Mm-hmm. Mm. And I would add to that, that for all of those things that make up the 1% of time, the, you know, all those attributes that society says I should have, many of them, I can work around and do in other ways. So, you know, with the tire example, I can I can call it AAA. Hannah hates making phone calls. So <laughs> I can be the one on the phone calling AAA. Like there, even for the things that society says, you must be able to do this as a man, there are ways to accomplish them, um, like adaptations that I've found to still be able to do them in some form yeah. or mm. another. So um, you say that percentage gets even smaller. Um, the number of times that like my physical ability factors into something that we're doing. Mm-hmm. Mm. Yeah, but but we know, you know, just from research that uh, transgressing these uh, uh, ideals of masculinity, it doesn't just bring uh, men... Um, like emotional, you know, shame and, and and what you're you're talking about, which is like sort of the psychological struggle of that. That men who, for example, make less money than their wives have like more cardiovascular issues. They are more oh, likely yeah. to develop diabetes. They're more mm-hmm. likely to have physical ailments, right? Just from and again, researchers have have you know uh, made sure that it's not other things that are really coming out to play that they really controlled for other variables still they 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 really assign um the fact that men who make less than their wives that they they're, they're less healthy to the idea that that there's something really really difficult in our society about feeling like you're not living up to an ideal um that's been set and again just like you're talking Shane you make it about you right you you say well I can't do this one thing. So there must be something wrong with me, right? There must be something broken about me. And I just think how much uh, pain we could avoid by letting people really be freely who they are and to, to, to be more free in their relationships, um, whether, you know, they're, uh, disabled or not, uh, you, you're, you're, you're actually representing, uh, something that, you know, the reason why you get so many of these comments, uh, is because we're not used to unfortunately seeing couples like you even though they they 100 percent exist and are 100 percent out there even um you know when we think about representation that's been positive for people with disabilities like love on the spectrum well not to say that's positive i i, I think it's a positive it's a net positive in the sense that we're seeing uh people going on dates who are on the autism spectrum and finding love but the criticism um from many people within the disability community and and particularly the autistic community is that you know why is it just autistic people dating each other Right. Why um, not show that 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 actually there's a whole range of, of, of people that uh, people who are on the spectrum are dating mm-hmm. and um, curious when it comes to representation, how can we like what would you like to see uh, when you turn yeah. on your TV, when you go to see a, a, a movie? Um, what would be meaningful in, in, in terms of the way that we represent um, love um, and, and people with disabilities who are in love? Yeah, that's a good question. I think so many of the issues that we face as a couple that I face as a disabled man that millions of disabled people face all over the world are a direct result of media representation. Like so much of our ideas and beliefs about the world, which then dictate our actions, are formed by what we watch. And 
it's been really healthy for me to realize that um, and to like connect the kind of mistreatment and prejudice and ableist ideas that I've faced my whole life to this like larger than me idea that like well every movie shows you that like you have to be a, a strong athletic man um, if you're a guy and it's not it's not just the natural way of things it's mm. just what messages we've been given um so that was a big reason that we kind of made our youtube channel and do it to this day it's a big reason why we're sharing so much of our life is because people need more examples of what disability looks like rather than the like handful of examples that we do see in the media um and I think it's funny because, you know, some people see our channel and it is a positive representation for them and they feel more free in their relationship or, you know, looking for a partner to be, you know, outside of the norms of masculinity or femininity or whatever. But then other people see it and it is such a threat to them. It's it's usually men see it and, you know, <laughs> me being my husband is like so beyond their, you know, <laughs> imagination. Their and fragile like, masculinity. Yeah. And I've worked my entire life to, you know, have muscles and, you know, I know how to change a tire and I still don't have a girlfriend. And the fact that Shane does means that there's something wrong with me, you know, like mm. that's not, that shouldn't be possible in their mind. <laughs> instead of being like, huh, you know, maybe emotional, you know, <laughs> intelligence is important. But that's <laughs> fascinating that you're fascinating. a threat to their ideal, right? That like, they're like, no, no, no. The rule is if I'm strong, if I can mow the lawn, then I get a, I get a woman, this transaction, right? And you're directly threatening that, which is so fascinating. But that's what the world has told us. That's what that's why we're doing this show. That's why I also have compassion for that man, Hannah. Because mm -hmm. the world has told him, the world has told me that if I do this, this, and this, that I will have a wife like you. And Shane breaks all of those rules. So in his mind, he's done everything he's supposed to do and he's a victim. This is the problem. This is the issue. This is the this is the misconception. This is the struggle because it's all a lie. None of it's real. And no one is owed to you, right? Too. It's an entitlement, right? You go to the emotional gym, you go to the spiritual gym, and that's that's what makes us, if anything, not just better men, but humans, which is why, Shane, when you said, like, I don't really think about my gender during the day. That's how, honestly, it should be. We're not supposed to. I don't, I honestly believe we're not supposed to be thinking about, walking around thinking about our gender, right? In the Baha'i faith, we're told that the soul has no sex. We're, like, we're all souls connecting, and what you guys are demonstrating is a deep soul connection, and if you strip away all the noise... That's all that matters. Yeah. And I love that so much, man. I love what I, I just, I just admire and love your relationship. Go ahead, Jimmy. <laughs> yes. uh, I, I also um, have some thoughts. This is interesting how my brain is working. So um, we don't want to make distinctions between um, so much. We want, we want to make sure that there's equality in all things and everyone's represented equally and fairly in all of this. Having someone, this is mental disabilities, not physical ones, but having a brother who's downs, uh, he, he has experiences and will always have experiences that are different than someone else. Um, and we can't pretend that he doesn't, right? Um, because otherwise you don't, um, you don't learn and you don't have the same, w all the stuff that comes with that, compassion. Um, so then with physical di disabilities, I'd love to know, Shane, how that works for you. Because of course, there, you, you, you don't want anyone to say, I don't see you. I don't see you see me for who I am and for the challenges in my experience in life. Um, and that experience as a man is different than mine and different than Justin's. How, how would you like the world um, typically to, to, to approach that? Yeah. Again, this, these are big questions. Um, so shrinking it down, I'll try to be concise. Um, I think that what you're talking about is my own pride in my identity as a disabled man. Mm -hmm. And that has changed a lot in my lifetime. Mm. Earlier in life, I hated the fact 
that I was disabled. And if someone came up to me and said, I don't even see your wheelchair. I just see you, Shane. I, I love that. I thought that was a great thing. I didn't want to be connected to my wheelchair. I didn't want to be connected to the disability community. I didn't want to be disabled. Uh, and that was because of society and our world. And I was learning and internalizing the fact that the world is not accessible and that the world has all this stigma about disability. They, they believe that you should cure your disability and not have it. Um, as I got older and met more and more adults living with disability who had careers and families and marriages and just these great lives that to me was never what I thought disability was about. I thought mm. it was about having a bad life and being alone and not being worth anything. So all these older adults made me begin to think, okay, why am I, why am I so, why am I thinking about my future so bleakly? And why do I feel like I don't have worth as a partner? Um, and it was because of all that societal stuff that told me that. So in my mid to late twenties, even today, uh, I am getting better about loving my disabled self. Mm -hmm. um, and so many, like thousands of disabled people that I've met have already gotten there. Um, mm -hmm. And they want you to see their disability and acknowledge it and realize that it's not a bad thing. Um, because you know, today I believe that I am not inherently wrong or broken in any way. Uh, mm. and then like getting to that point mm. has taken mm. me 29 years, um, and a lot of struggle along the way. And I, I think we just need to, we need to all come to the agreement that disability is not a bad thing, but that the way that we think about disability and the ways that we organize our world and our societies makes it really hard to be disabled. But that's the fault of society and our world, not disabled people themselves. Mm. I think that, mm. if that makes sense. Thank <laughs> you for sharing that. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. It's really, really, really sweet, really good to hear. And how has that mm. freed you, Hannah? I'm less annoying. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> trying to fix yeah, because I think so much of this is right, like women, you know, are are, are part of this too that that I think that we somehow feel less feminine or feel again that there's something wrong with us if we're doing something that is quote unquote masculine or if our partner, right? So I'm I'm just curious if that, you know, uh, made you think about your role and yourself and what, was there any rethinking of that and, and how did that sort of set you free to also just be fully yourself? Yeah, I'm trying to think back to like six years ago when we met because growing up, I, I'm tall, so I'm 5'10", and I always had the idea that my partner would have to be taller than me. So, you know, at least like six, one, six, two, that would make me look <laughs> feminine. Uh, you know, all of these things. Wow. Yeah. He's oh, just it, was, it was Michael Phelps. Yeah. So that, was, yeah. Yeah. that was like, that was a good height. <laughs> um, so yeah, I had all those ideas and I think just like when I met Shane, we got along so perfectly. It, it honestly, we've said this before, but it felt like there wasn't a choice. Like we were just like, Oh, like this is our person. We're done. Like, it yeah. doesn't really matter what we look like, yeah. you know? So I think just being with him, I think less and less. And now I don't think about it at all. I'm just trying to think back to like years ago. I just began thinking less and less about my presentation, like how I was appearing feminine and like, what do I look like right now? And, you know, am I looking like too large next to Shane? Like all of these things have just like gone away by being mm. in a relationship with him because I'm like, well, it doesn't really matter anymore. Like, I don't, I don't care. Mm. You know, so I think that's been like a yeah, a thing. Do you want to talk at all about my burden complex? Because that was, I mean, you true. Were... You coming? Yeah. yeah. When I first met Shane, he had what he calls a burden complex, and like he's still, it's still a thing. But it was like raging when we met, and it was a basically raging burden complex. Raging <laughs> complex. It was basically just he felt guilty asking for help. He felt like he was being annoying. That he was being 
you know, ruining my day. And so if I would sit down on the couch, he would be like, oh, I'm not going to ask for anything because then she has to get up. And if he did have to ask for something, he would apologize. And so for the first like two years, every time Shane would be like, sorry, I would be like, stop apologizing. Like, it's fine. I really don't mind, you know, grabbing your glasses for you or whatever it is. Um, and then over the next, you know, four years after that, I think Shane, like we had a lot of conversations about it in depth and specifically, and he has become way less, you know, in apologetic, apologetic. Mm. Yeah. 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 I, I think that our relationship got healthier as I felt less and less like a burden. Mm-hmm. And I do a hundred percent credit Hannah with giving that to me. Um, I, I feel significantly healthier and more positive in my everyday life, not feeling like I'm walking on eggshells every time I have to ask for help. Mm-hmm. Um, so mm-hmm. I, I just mm-hmm. think it's interesting that like Hannah was an integral part of that change for me. And had you ever been in this, any kind of similar situation before Shane? Yeah. Have you ever taken care of anybody or wiped someone's ass? Or, <laughs> no. <laughs> she, she, I mean, what what I joke was, are you gonna do, Shane? Go ahead, go for it. <laughs> You're so excited. What's your joke? Her, like, <laughs> her main interest is the ass wiping. Um, so that, that was like the main thing she was looking mm-hmm. for. Yeah. No. <laughs> no. I had never. I didn't even know anybody that used a wheelchair. Like I just. I had no idea. Uh, if you would ask me, like, what is ableism? I probably would have been like, I don't know, not, you know, something about disability. I had like no involvement in the disability community. Didn't know anybody that was disabled. I had never been like a caregiver. In fact, my, I'm like <laughs> talking about how I improved my like emotional side. I was never really like a touchy feely person. And so like my parents still joke about the fact that like I you know, am Shane's caregiver and I like help him. And they're like, you're the last person that we would have guessed would be good at that. Like wow. they always joked about when they're older, they're going to go to my brother's house and not mine because he's like, you know, an emotional like person. Nurturing. <laughs> Nurturing. Yeah. Um, and so I just like never was mm. really like a, you know, a caregiver yeah. type. You were never like, oh, I'm going to be a mommy someday. Yeah. That was never like, really yeah. my goal to be like nurturing. Like I wasn't like a great babysitter. You know, I just didn't have that. God, that just made me tear up you saying that because I, Mm. because again, I'm just, I'm just going to, I'll just direct and be super real with my own unconscious bias. There's, I think there was even a part of me that wondered if that was, if you were just innately that type of person. Yeah. And like, if, if, and just the, the assumption that like, oh, she's, she loves that. She's drawn to she's drawn yeah. to being she's super, you know, because everybody's born with their own things and we're results of our own traumas and I think there was a part of me that just judged or assumed that maybe you were just naturally this amazing nurturing caretaker and it, nope. and hearing <laughs> that <laughs> and like and hearing that just like <laughs> he's saying no nope, no nope. <laughs> hearing that like cracked my heart wide open and I got teary-eyed because it's like wow like I hate you know, love, Lo- like talk about a powerful force that can change us, yeah. that can like, like get, get rid of prejudices and biases. Like you are just be- a testimony to the power of love right now. Like <laughs> I, I just blown away. And I love that she sucked at it, Shane, because I can only imagine, <laughs> I can only imagine how funny that must have been. You're like, what are you doing? Like, no. So <laughs> I appreciate you sharing that, both of you, and and Shane, you being vulnerable enough to share that, that that was a struggle to ask and then to feel like you were burdening her. I mean, when I referenced my wife taking care of me for six weeks, that after two weeks, I did this, I, I mean, and I'm sorry to compare myself, but just in my own experience for that moment, I felt uh, I couldn't ask her for a period of time anymore because I felt, and also, to be fair and honest, it was a lift for her. It wasn't just like nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I could see that it was a lift, like, oh, hey, honey, can you go get me a glass of water? And she would do it with love. But I remember one time I caught her have a little bit of a gasp because she had been up six, seven times. And it was in that moment I thought, oh, I'm being a burden. And then I stopped, but she addressed it. We had a conversation about it and she made me feel safe for feeling mm-hmm. it. She acknowledged, um, baby, that, look, obviously, it's it's um, not just a cakewalk. I'm not gonna pretend it's a cakewalk, but I love you and this is what we do. And let me tell you all the things you do for me in different ways that you probably exhale for. 
and that helped. So um, I'm sure, Hannah, that uh, there must have been conversations where you acknowledged that it's a lift. Every, you know, in, in all relationships, doing whatever it can be a lift. That doesn't mean that we don't do it and 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 with love and joy for the other uh, the other partner, whatever that may be. And I love that you 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 say that, or sh- at least acknowledge that. Yeah, and I think you know now that our caregiving routine is so ingrained in our life, it doesn't feel as much as a lift, you know, because it, mm. it's it's just so routine. Uh, mm. When we're like getting up in the morning and getting ready together, it, I'm not thinking about like, oh, I'm helping Shane right now. It's just our daily routine and we're talking and, you know, getting ready mm. for the day. Um, but there are definitely moments where I don't really feel like getting up. And, and that happens with everything, like whether it's I need to walk the dog or Shane wants a glass of water or like I need to do laundry or we have to post a video. Like there's there's tons of things that you might be like, oh, my God, I don't really feel like doing this right now. But, mm. you know. Shane's caregiving is definitely not like a, mm. a the right. massive burden that you would like people think it is, you know, I'm sure for like him too. Him. He doesn't, he doesn't want to uh, have to be emotionally supportive for you on days. <laughs> exactly. or, or... Like another, <laughs> another talk. And there's, I mean, there's been moments here and there where, yeah, like that, that thing that you said, Jamie, about, you know, you notice the sigh and that just like kills you inside. Like we've had those moments. Like that's, that's human. Um, and I, but I think there's a difference between like how I handle it. So I, we've had moments where I do notice a sigh. Maybe it's been a really long day and I decide that now is a great time to ask for my third beer, uh, or something <laughs> like that, you know, like right after she's laid down. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have a choice about how I handle that sigh and whether or not I, I choose to like view it as a a negative about me. Mm -hmm. Um, In the past, I've been guilty of, you know, if she does sigh, you know, say, oh, never mind, never mind, never mind. Like Mm -hmm. you got mad and almost like getting like mad at her about it, like Mm -hmm. for expressing emotion. Um, That is super unhealthy and super not a good way to handle things. today we have both like gotten to a point where i know that like not 24 hours a day is it always going to be the best moment for hannah to get me a beer or whatever it is uh and so allowing that truth to be part of our life is yeah. and know that nice. it's not like a personal yeah you know attack on you like if um, i don't feel like doing something in the moment it's not like i don't want to be in a relationship with yeah. you you know it's just like i don't think you really need to be here right now but i'll get it you know it's, mm. it's not like a big deal it's a very like small thing yeah mm. yeah i love how I got- in one of our videos you were like when we're in a fight i might not ask her to get me a beer but like that's the one time where i don't <laughs> i just thought that's that's um, and I feel like we all, again, we all have those moments and fights where it's like, okay, but can you help me with my taxes? Cause yeah, I do, yeah. Yeah, even though you're in the middle of this crazy thing and yeah, it's just, we, we all have needs, right? What a cool way to, um, to have, to also like have the fight dissolve. Mm-hmm. There's just something actually that brings you back together, like a rubber band. We've uh-huh. said, we've said lots of times that the caregiving in our relationship makes it so much stronger. And it's for that reason right there. Like if we're having a big fight about anything, anything, yeah. taxes, <laughs> um, and we go our separate ways and we don't want to talk to each other, other couples where caregiving is not a thing, they might let that drag out overnight or another day or another week because of this one big fight. Mm-hmm. But I have to go to Hannah at some point and say, can you help me pee? Yeah. And like, that is like, the intimacy of it is almost funny to us. Like we've we've had moments where I come in after a fight and you know, maybe I'm at fault here. And I make a joke about like apologizing so that I can pee or whatever. Like we make it funny and it, it mm-hmm. brings us together because it has to. Yeah, it immediately ends the fight. Yeah. Mm. So on that note, I just want to I want to ask one sex question. Um, how how do you guys keep it sexy? <laughs> I want to know about how you keep it sexy because I mean, look, even down to like, you know, I remember dating, and it's like, oh, I got it. 
I got to take a crap. I don't want to do it in her bathroom or like, you know, um, and I know for a lot of women, especially like poop and, you know, they're very embarrassed about it. You know, there's just, there's just a lot of stuff that can, um, get in the way I'm using air quotes of sex. And I'd love to know how you guys keep it sexy, Hannah, maybe how, you know, some of the stuff you struggle with, Shane, what do you struggle with? Cause, um, cause the truth is, and we know a lot of married couples struggle with sex. Mm-hmm. Whether they are interabled or not, we try to we try to keep some things private. Good um, for you. Good, good. <laughs> like the number of times that a caregiving activity, like showering or getting undressed, the number of times that those caregiving activities have turned into sex. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, the thousands, like. And it, there's no point where I'm like, okay, pause the tears of him. Yeah. It's time for sex. Like, <laughs> like it, just, it, it just happens because showering is a naturally intimate moment. And yeah. we're both there. So, you know, why not? Um, so, yeah, I did. That is one way that people don't mm. think about. But, like, because of my tears of him, I'm naked in front of Hannah. A, a lot and uh that leads to intimacy yeah mm. and i you know we do get comments from people especially with like the ass wiping stuff you know people will be like how could you possibly you know have sex after that and i don't like oh, i just God. i don't really get i maybe i'm just like not understanding their point because we like it just we do you know like i'm not really sure how we like keep it sexy but it just well, I think you answered the question. You keep yeah. it sexy with emotional intimacy. I guess so. Like, it just hasn't been a problem, so I'm not really sure what to tell them, you yeah. know? Yeah, and I think that's a really foreign thing for people. That's a really foreign thing for people because yeah. most, I'm, I would say a lot of married couples struggle with emotional intimacy, mm-hmm. right? The feeling like you are in a marriage, but the person kind of can become a stranger or a friend or a housemate. There's a, there's a lack of emotional intimacy, which I believe it is at the core of everything that men crave. When we think we want sex, what we actually want is emotional intimacy. Mm-hmm. And that's what you're demonstrating. It's not about this or that or wiping his ass or carrying him in the shower or whatever it is. You have It's an emotional intimacy that is what keeps it sexy. And that is the greatest answer. Yeah, and and you know too, uh, just, just, hey guys. So this morning, my wife just walked by me. There was no physical touch. She walked by me and I was the most turned on than I have been in I don't know how long. Sex is not, obviously there's, there's a physical touch that's included in that. But real intimate and, and sex is uh, so many other things. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's different to each couple. What I take from it is like, oh wow, it's all about emotional connection. It's all about emotional intimacy. It doesn't matter who you are or where you are or what you're doing. And that I think is extremely valuable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey Liz, are we jumping into rapid fire questions? I know you got something. When was the last time that you each cried or together, however you want to do it? We just talked about yours. Yeah, should I go first? I mean, rapid fire, but mine was uh, not last night, but the night before. And it was for, it was like Shane was asleep and I was in bed and I was remembering this horrible story about a mouse that I experienced years ago when I was crying in bed because I couldn't fall asleep and I was frustrated and I thought about this mouse and I started to cry. It's absurd. What was your shame? She told me that very nonchalantly last night. Yeah. Last night. Oh, I forgot to tell you. I was crying in bed. We were watching a movie and she was like, I tried last night. I was like, what? (laughs) What the heck? Um, My last night. Brian, uh, man, it's been a while. It might have been okay. So, for like real life things, I don't cry a whole lot. Um, but like, I'll get teary eyed during an emotional movie that I find beautiful. Mm. Um, so unfortunately, because I don't have like a distinct memory of recently crying. It was probably while we were watching a movie, and I was like, "That's the most beautiful line I've ever heard." And I just cry at all in those moments. Yeah, sweet. <laughs> Let me ask you, um, and again, rapid fire. Uh, what is something you're afraid of? Dying. 
first mm. thing came to mind. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, this is not rapid fire. Well, I'll, yeah, I know. I'm just saying. It's okay. For me, I think it's like people that I love dying. Other people dying. Oh, I'm super selfish. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. <laughs> Beautiful. That's Those are real, real answers. Uh, when was the last time you apologized? I think it, for me, it might have been like two days ago when I told Hannah the wrong time that we had a meeting and we ended up being late for it uh, because I looked at the calendar and saw the wrong time. Wow. Mm. I think it's the last time I apologize. <laughs> no. <laughs> I think Shane apologizes more than me. Maybe I do less wrong things. Oh. You know, Shane's also better at apologizing. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Probably true. Facts. Facts. Um, <laughs> Uh, Jay, I know you're going to go into a question, but let me just ask, uh, and, and again, just you don't have to give any context, just quickly. Shane, one thing that you love about Hannah? Her sense of humor. Hannah, one thing you love about Shane? His thoughtfulness. Shane, one thing that disturbs you about Hannah? When she's on her phone, she zones out and becomes a zombie. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, uh, Hannah, what about you? One thing that's a struggle or disturbed you about Shane? Uh, his lack of ability to relax. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's, I love that's... it. Okay, you have a time machine. Both of you have a time machine. What? And you get to go into the past and see your eight, seven, six-year-old selves. What do you say? I'm telling myself to stop trying to hide the fact that you're different from most of the other kids or in the neighborhood or in your class. Um, just be proud of who you are and embrace it and know that you're going to have a good life. <laughs> like your future is bright and not as scary as you might think it is. Yeah, I think that's similar to what I would say. Just like, you know, everything is going to be good in the future. Mm. It's going to, everything's going to work out. Mm. Okay. And now you can take your time machine and you're going to go and be a guest at your own funeral. Perfect question, Shane, since you were afraid of death. Um, <laughs> what do you hope is said about you and the way that you move through the world? Um, I think that I uh, stood up for what I believed in, you know, cared about things and and fought for them, like, you know, made it clear what I care about and what I stand for. And mine would be that mm. I improved the lives of the people around me mm. and made their time worthwhile and fun. Mm. Oh, funny. That's made so their funny. time funny. <laughs> 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 Oh, that's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. All right, final question uh, for both of you. What does it mean to be man enough? I think it means being there for your partner in a way that they need from you. So not what you think they need, but what they actually need from you and supporting that as best you can or striving to support that. Yeah, absolutely. I think like being, you know, the best version of yourself that you can be not, you know, trying to piece together all these things that you think you should be. Mm. Mm. Well, uh, Hannah and Shane. Shane, first of all, you're not just man enough, my friend. You are enough in every sense of the word. And Hannah, oh my God, mm. you are incredible. And, uh, and so much more than enough. And thank you both for being on the show and for being such incredible examples of just humans. Thank um, you. I, yeah. really I appreciate you. More. I'm enjoying all this praise. So I know. If we can, maybe we should make this a week to this day. Well, what I, would, so I, what I would love to say, in, in my just wrapping up with, I, I, um, I see you both as incredible spirits and souls and, and lights. Uh, 
I see you for your humanity and, and just what you are. And I also, because I am one that walks through a world with my experience, I also see and recognize your unique experience in life mm -hmm. and am grateful that both of you in your own respects um, are open and share it with the world. Because in order for our world to look different, we can't just stay in our caves, you know, with our struggles and our joys. And um, I appreciate that side as well. It's really, really sweet. Thanks for talking with us. Thank you for using your lives and filming. I know it's a, it's a, it's a pain in the ass to film <laughs> and edit all that. And you know, I know you've turned it into a career, but I also know that it's probably hard, and you do want to keep some things sacred and private. And so I, yeah. I really appreciate the work that you guys do. It's really helpful for, for everyone. Thank you guys for yeah, coming on the thank show. Thank you so Thanks. much for taking the time. Thank you. Uh, we will be right back. Hello and welcome back to Man Enough. Oh, those two. Those two. Mm. What a sweet conversation to have with them and so much to learn and their vulnerability and um, and just their ability to articulate really well, you know, their experience, but also to take it out of their, their own experience really mm -hmm. to the macro mm. is really... Uh, yeah. No, it really just nice. makes you also think how uncomfortable we are with true intimacy, right? The idea that um, that because she's that intimate physically with him in her caretaking, that that would somehow be a turnoff, I think is so interesting. And like, so being that close to someone and knowing them truly uh, in the good and the bad or what, you know, however you want to describe that that's that that's that that's a bad thing. That's a turnoff, yeah. I think, tells us a lot about it us about our society yeah. right? it's a mirror and it's a how mirror we view relationships but you know what T to be fair um and i hope it's okay to say this i i understand it i mean sure you're right i mean the fact that we're interested in that and, and someone says like what is that like for you to have to wipe his butt and such and such i i've if my wife says can you come wipe my butt that's not the first thing i want to do i have a brother <laughs> that i have to i do have to wipe his butt he's a grown man and i have to do it i don't uh, I understand everyone's because it's hard. We're like, because we don't have that experience. What I love mm. is that we can say it and then maybe unlearn. Why is it? What is so difficult? Yes. So I, I appreciate that they're willing to address it because mm -hmm. it's really a real feeling and we're not mm. bad for thinking it. Yeah. Also, I've never wiped a man's butt, but I feel like I've done it uh, symbolically in many different ways. That yes, you have. Um, you have indeed. So it's oh, all, you again, have. all in, in the definition of like what's normal, right? And what's uh, what's caretaking, what's uh, all, all of these definitions, which I think is the most interesting part of this conversation. Mm. It really mm. turns everything on its head and makes us think about ourselves. It makes us think about like, why do we define these things in this way? Right. The big takeaway for me was... Uh, the thing I wrote down, which was, you know, like 98% of the time, we don't need all of the things that we spend our lives trying to acquire mm -hmm. all these traits as men. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure, and I'm sure women may have their own versions of them. I'm, um, totally. But as you know, I look at Shane and he's more than capable. He's more than capable. He's giving her mm -hmm. everything that she's ever wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and it's really, it's, it was really nice for me to look at that and go, oh, I have some, I have some more unwiring, unlearning to do, even in my mm. own marriage. Because mm. um, again, you only need it for 1% at the time. And <laughs> that 1%, as he said, he has other solutions and workarounds. So mm. I just really yeah. appreciated that. And I think that if, if all of us men uh, could, could really look at the way we spend our time and what we're developing and building in ourselves for a partner, um, I think that there are some other things that we could be developing to to get a lot stronger that Shane is a master in that would actually lead to our own happiness and lead to mm. much happier marriages. Um, yeah, so well I just said. I loved that episode. It was really really sweet, um, and I can't wait to I can't wait to see how they're doing and check in with them. Mm. You know, maybe even next season because they're yeah. awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks. All right. If you like what you hear, please check us out at manenough.com slash podcast. Uh, or wherever you listen to your podcasts, like and subscribe. And uh, until next time, I'm Justin Baldoni. I'm Liz Plank. I'm Jamie Heath. And this is Man Enough. Man Enough.